Today's presentation is brought to you through the Center for Development Excellence Division here at the COG. The presentation by the Managing Director of BetterBlock.org will be followed by a discussion with panelists active with the Slow Streets program in the City of Dallas. The webinar today will discuss, one, what is the Slow Street program, two, the benefits of the program for the neighborhood, and three, how to apply for this grant-funded neighborhood program. The moderator today is Amanda Popkin. Amanda is a community strategist and economic development specialist focused on placemaking and urban design through promoting, inspiring, teaching, and engaging communities to grow their own social capital. She is also president of the Congress for the New Urbanism North Texas and can be found at amandapopkin.com. Amanda, I turn control of this webinar over to you. Thanks so much, Carolyn. I will go ahead and introduce our distinguished guests and panelists reading their bios. Um, Councilman Chad West, he was elected to the Dallas City Council in May of 2019 to represent District 1, the citizens of Oak Cliff. The son of a retired farmer and a teacher and principal, Chad first came to Texas over 20 years ago with the U.S. Army, where he served at Fort Sam Houston and later traveled overseas to Hungary and Bosnia. After completing his military tour, Chad was honorably discharged as a combat veteran and attended law school at Texas Tech School of Law, where he graduated with honors. And prior to his election to Dallas City Council, Chad served on the Dallas City Planning Commission from 2017 to 18. That's where I first met him. And I know that that deep understanding has been a hallmark of his service at the city. As District 1's representative on the Planning Commission, Chad played key roles in advocating for and drafting ordinances for live work, accessory dwelling units, ADUs and granny flats, and also inclusionary zoning, all of which are currently being used by the city of Dallas to create more rooftops for residences of all income levels. Welcome, Chad. We've also got Miguel Thank Solis. You. Miguel Solis is the executive director of the Coalition for New Dallas. Since, 20, 29, <laughs> since 2009, he has served the residents of Dallas in the areas of education and housing. In 2013, Miguel was elected to the Dallas Independent School District Board of Trustees at the age of 27. And during his tenure, he has also served as the board president and vice president, making him the youngest person to have ever held these roles. As Dallas ISD trustee, Miguel's efforts have included drafting and unanimously passing the district's first early childhood education policy, a ban on out of school suspensions for the district's youngest children, which now is a state law, and a comprehensive racial equity policy department, as well as helping create the district's revolutionary teacher excellence evaluation support and pay system along among many other initiatives. During his decade of service to the district, Dallas ISD has undergone a monumental transformation, which has seen the number of improvement required schools drop from 60 to three. Welcome, Miguel. Thanks for joining us. And Ali Hatefi, it should be joining us shortly. Ali is the Assistant Director for the City of Dallas Public Works Department, overseeing construction inspection and right-of-way management. Mr. Tuffy holds a PE license in professional civil engineering um, with more than 15 years of experience in both the private and public sectors. With a master's degree in environmental science from SMU, he's been with the City of Dallas now for almost seven years and has served in various departments and departments. <laughs> Diana Torres is joining us. Diana, are you here? Yes. Great. Um, Diana Torres was born, Torres Rivera, excuse me, was born and raised in Puerto Rico and has been in Dallas for five years now with one year living in Oak Cliff. She has a PhD in Spanish American literature and history and is the World Languages Chair at Bishop Dunn Catholic, where she teaches Spanish. She's a mom of three young children and she and her husband love the environment in Oak Cliff. It's a place to enjoy sharing with their neighbors and they spend a lot of time walking around the community. Welcome, Diana. Hi. Krista Nightingale um, is the managing director of the Better Block Foundation, began her career in journalism and worked at the magazine where I met her years ago, where she stumbled into the fascinating world of urban design. She soon discovered the Better Block Foundation, where she now works to help with its growth, spread its story, and make the world a little better by working alongside communities. 
Better Block is an international urban design nonprofit that educates, equips, and empowers communities and their leaders to reshape and reactivate their built environment to promote the growth of healthy and vibrant neighborhoods. Welcome panelists, we're so excited to have you here and to talk about Slow Streets in Dallas. Chris is gonna give us a brief overview of the new Dallas Slow Streets program, and then we'll have our Q&A, uh, our uh, brief discussion with our panelists and then a Q&A. Please do put your questions in the chat box as you're listening to the presentation on the program and meeting our panelists and talking through um, this program. Thank you all so much for having us. Um, thank you to the COG for putting this program together and, and thank you attendees for being here with us. Krista, take it away. Awesome. Thank you so much, Amanda, and thank you everyone for being here and um, joining us in the middle of the day to talk about a slow streets program. It's really exciting. Um, so, as Amanda mentioned, I am just going to uh, give you a little bit of background on what this program is, and then we'll turn over to the more interesting content, which is listening to our panelists who have been a part of putting this together and who are experiencing this on their street. Um, so the Slow Streets program is in partnership with the Better Block, Bike DFW, Amanda Popkin Development, the Coalition for a New Dallas, and the City of Dallas. Um, so the way this all got started is when COVID-19 happens, people started looking at um, ways in which they could get out of their houses, but still be safe and maintain so safe social distancing. So we saw the initiatives taking off around the country, and we started looking at places that we could do it here in Dallas. Um, our first proposal was on 7th Street in Oak Cliff. And um, as we started talking about it, it was pretty obvious that that was not the best idea. Um, so we took some lessons learned from that and we started looking at other initiatives that were happening, specifically in Kansas City, Missouri. They had an interesting approach to their program where they allowed the community to apply to have their street be a slow street um, and then they would supply some of the materials needed and they would have a permit that would be for a specific amount of time. So we took that approach and uh, we looked again at Dallas and said, okay, what if we did the same kind of thing here? And um, so Amanda found the block party permit through Public Works and we reached out to Ali and his team and said, what if this was, what if we looked at this, we tweaked it to where you're not having the party part, uh, but communities could actually apply to make their street on their block a slow street. So that was kind of what was pitched, was neighborhoods could apply to be a part of it. Um, it's a pilot project. It would just be for 10 communities for 30 days. And then um, with partners, we would supply all of the things that would be needed to make that happen. The criteria for the street was pretty straightforward. Uh, they needed to be low traffic streets. They needed to be in neighborhoods. Um, you couldn't have any signals along that street. The applicants who applied for the permit agreed to be a block captain, which I'll explain that in a moment. They had to get approval from 25% of the neighbors on that street. It was limited to just one street. Um, the street would be closed to through traffic, but it would be open to local traffic, deliveries, emergency vehicles, um, and city services. And then um, you couldn't have any existing um, construction or anything like that happening on the street at the time of your permit. Uh, part of the process, a big part of the process, is you had to talk to your neighbors about the idea. Um, you had to get approval in writing from 25% of your neighbors, uh, but you also had to prove that you had reached out to all of your neighbors along your street to let them know about the program. I believe the first person we had apply, she said she got 70% of her neighbors to approve. Uh, the 30% that didn't approve were out of town or weren't there, so that was the only reason they didn't sign off. Um, and then once all of that was finished, they could send up their design and do their application. So we sent out some uh, sample verbiage to let people know, like, this is what you could do to kind of let your neighbors know what's happening in this area and what you're proposing. For the design of the street, again, really simple. Um, it, we basically were looking at just doing barricades on either end to kind of slow down the traffic as they're coming through or just stop the through traffic from being a part of it. Um, and this was the really simple design that the city put together to kind of show what this would look like. 
type three barricades on either end with a type one barricade about 30, 40 feet in from that. Um, and like I said, it's really simple. There's really not much to it, but the feedback we've received is that it's made a big difference. And I'll let Diana talk a little bit more about that and um, who's actually been experiencing it on her street. The application is really simple and the city made it really easy for people to just go through, upload the design, upload the signatures. And then originally we said the applicant would hear back in about three days. Ali, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it's been more like 24 hours at most. And um, so they've been turning around um, the process very quickly. If a neighborhood is approved, um, the block captain kind of takes on the charge. So uh, they are the people that are on the street. They're the ones who are gathering the materials and putting them out. And um, they have signage in their in their um, lot saying, I am the block captain. They had to share their contact information so that if anyone had issues or if there was anything that needed to happen, they were the go to person and they would work with us. So this is kind of what that signage looks like uh, that the neighbors put on the street um, and included their information on it. Um, and then once they were approved, um, our partners provided the materials that would happen. So again, that was uh, Amanda Popkin Development by DFW and the Coalition for New Dallas provided the funding for this. And what we did is we rented the barricades um, for 30 days. Uh, we got them safety vests, we got stencils and all the supplies you needed for stenciling. Um, and then we also offered um. some salting and a how-to guide as well. So if you'd like to see the guide, it's online at betterblock.org backslash Dallas Slow Streets. Um, and these are some of the supplies that we gave to the neighbors. Sometimes I just dropped it off in the yard. Other times I handed it off to folks. And so where we are now, we've got eight permits out, eight streets are up. The other two are coming in hopefully today or tomorrow. And um, we're gathering feedback. We have sent out surveys um, so that the neighbors can start assessing how the project is or isn't working. And we're looking at what may be next. So these are some of our neighbors who have put their streets up. Some of them are three weeks in the process. Some of them are two weeks into the process um, and they're all kind of following up and letting us know how everything is going. So that is a really quick background on the program as it stands. Um, so now I will turn it back over to Amanda to um, lead us through a conversation. Thanks, Doug. That's some really great basic information about what we've got going on. We've got going on. So, I wanted to start the conversation with our panelists off with um, Mr. Miguel Solis. I know the Coalition for New Dallas is deep into the urban design things that our city should be doing better to make a better city. And I know this is a passion um, and, and of yours as well, and you have a lot of experience in this. What were cities doing across the world addressing these needs of residents within the public realm in creative ways during COVID? What were you hearing about um, that made you really advocate for this particular program here in Dallas. Thank you, Amanda. I uh, am still getting used to the world of uh, digital meetings. Uh, you think that I've already got this mastered as a Dallas school board member, but uh, sure enough, I'm, I'm always learning. Um, first, for having me uh, to be a part of the panel and also thank you to the many partners that are on the line with us that have made this a reality. Um, a little bit about the coalition, just as a lead up to the to the answer, you know, we're an organization that has been uh, for, for many years now committed to making Dallas a walkable, connected and vibrant city. Uh, and we feel like we're certainly on the path as a city to getting to that point. But along the way, there have been physical and economic barriers that have been established in the city that have really divided our neighborhoods, reinforced segregation, stifled economic opportunity and have really put a focus on cars and transportation. It's not unique to Dallas. You know, we've seen this across uh, uh, cities in the nation, and we've also seen this in, in cities across the globe. But what COVID has provided us is a unique opportunity to really revolutionize the way we think about urban planning. And so that's what led us to this notion of supporting uh, a move towards slow streets. We saw it bubbling up across the globe. Um, there have been some cities, uh, namely cities like, you know, Berlin and Paris here in America, cities like Seattle and New York, 
cities that are comparable in size, I'd say, to a Dallas that closed streets and said, we're going to turn these streets back to people because we want these streets at this unique time to protect people, specifically when it comes to social distancing and being outside. And so as we saw that happening uh, and bubbling up uh, across the globe, we said, well, what is Dallas doing to try to also test the boundaries of urban planning? Um, we had started a project in Oak Lawn that we immediately saw uh, have uh, a neighborhood pushback. Um, and so we took a step back and we said, well, are there other places where we could potentially do this? And at that time, uh, found out about the work that the Better Block was doing. And we found what, what Better Block had created with, with Ali and city staff to be probably the best approach, which is a neighborhood opt-in approach. It seemed to be gaining traction uh, amongst people in, in uh, you know, uh, spatial distribution across the entire city. Um, but there wasn't any one neighborhood that had, had risen up and said, we want to do this. And so when Better Block came to us with this proposal, we said, this is a great opportunity to get neighborhood opt-in and to try to revolutionize urban planning in a pilot way. Yeah, so really the community-driven aspect of it was what attracted you to this program. So Councilman West, I wanted to ask you, um, you became a vocal supporter of this initiative and helped connect the right city staff to uh, we community organizations with this idea. Um, why was this program something that you thought would be a good fit for the North Oak Cliff neighborhood of Dallas? Um, thanks for the question, Amanda. First off, thanks to COG and to everyone here for your hard work on uh, pulling together the Slow Streets Initiative. Um, this is, it's been a, uh, it's been very quick, just like we saw with the parklets concept that Amanda, you know, has has been pushing forward, and with some other initiatives with the city. You know, what COVID has uh, really given us, uh, you know, it's awful. We would never want to see COVID again, of course, but it's given us the opportunity to see just how nimble and how fast um, staff can be, city staff, and how um, the same with with the elected officials. So. Um, one of my priorities when I was running for um, this seat for council um, is 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 to sh embrace the concept that um, cars don't necess aren't necessarily greater than than people or bikes or strollers or what have you. Like they don't. There should be no reason why uh, cars dominate our world of thinking as a community and as neighborhoods. And um, I've. I've really tried to build that into any policy that I ever look at and and try to remind my colleagues of that as well of thinking of you know when we're approving a development through zoning or when we're we're passing a streets manual on on how to design around streets um, you know to think about the perspective of a pedestrian and not just how cars are going to get into the development necessarily um, you know, it's it's kind of the great equalizer being able to walk to a neighborhood market or being able to walk somewhere. So it's really, um, I think that's that's very characteristic of our neighborhood as well. You've got a lot of sort of folks who are, are similar thinking to to myself in that aspect. We we originally, and I think Chris Chris was mentioning this a few minutes ago, talked about the Seventh Street um, situation, and that along with what Miguel mentioned with with Oaklawn were, were two. Um, situations where we were it was being proposed to block off streets for um as as a overflow for some of the trails that were in uh, uh that were overcrowded you know heard a lot of news stories about the katie trail uh being overcrowded with traffic and seventh street is a street that is right by bishop arts um it connects a lot of businesses to neighborhoods um it runs parallel to davis street which is a very busy traffic street and it it has been discussed before as a street that where that would be natural for bike lanes and for more pedestrians to use. And so it was pushed out there, uh, partly by my own fault, as a potential idea for us to uh, to close down as a trail alternative. Um, what we learned from that, and I think, or at least what I learned, and I think what the city learned from the Oak Lawn, uh, or the Turtle Creek potential closure was as Krista mentioned, it's better to come as a neighborhood driven initiative. It's better to come not as a top down. This is something that's good for you community, but more so like, you know, what would you like to see um, and let the neighbors sort of talk about it and decide if it's something that's good for them or not. And 
that way, instead of us having to educate them, um, they educated themselves and determined that, hey, we can still use this street in a way that's um, socially distant and COVID friendly. And so I think, you know, based on what I've heard, and I'm curious to hear a little bit more from Krista and the folks on this call about, um, and, and also Diana, um, on the feedback from the uh, from the neighborhoods um, on, on how, how that's gone, because I feel like, uh, I haven't heard any complaints about the slow streets, whereas when the 7th Street was proposed, my phone was blowing up. So, um, yeah, thank you. I'm so glad that you mentioned the, the, the part about the bikes and pedestrians. It seems like we've really seen an outpouring of people enjoying the outdoors in a different way during COVID. So, yeah, that's definitely a big part of why this is being successful. Um, Mr. Ali Hatefi, I want to chat with you a little bit about from the city side of this program. How is this program structured and why is the application process designed the way it is? Why public works? I think you're on mute right now. There we go. Good. Can you, yeah. Okay. Uh, good morning, everyone. And thanks for uh, having me. Uh, well, I, I guess, uh, Krista talked about the structure a little bit. Um, I just want to elaborate that, you know, uh, the system, our system is web based. The applicant goes online and apply for a permit and, uh, our staff review the permit in a couple of days and. Uh, they issued a permit. So why public works? Because we are um, by far one of the best department in the city. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Joke aside, um, I guess uh, the lane closure um, requires a permit. Uh, public works is the department who issues the permit for any lane closure or any type of closure within the city of Dallas. So that's how we got uh, involved with this process and this initiative. And um, I guess we uh, established the application process. First of all, uh, we didn't have that much time and that was a new experience for all of us. We decided to move forward as fast as possible to address the concern with the COVID-19 and uh, response to people's needs. So uh, we mimic what we had on the block party application uh, to create the same system for uh, permitting of these events. So I guess the main difference between a block party and um, Dallas Slow Street permit application is that on the block party, we need to have the 100 percent of all the people living within the block or within the, um, the closure lane, uh, they should agree to the uh, program. However, for um, so Dallas Slow Street, we told them that, you know, we, we established a way that the applicants should notify everyone. Uh, but as long as they have the 25 person approval, uh, we can uh, issue the permit. And that, that was one of the main differences between these two. Yeah, we really applauded the city staff for working with us to try to find a unique way forward. And it, it just so happened that there was a, a great program in place. Like you were saying, you guys are already taking online permits and there was kind of a template for us to follow already. Um, thank you. Thanks for being a partner on this. Absolutely. Uh, Ms. Chris Nightingale, how did the partner organizations come together for this program and what's been the process for getting these projects on the ground? Yeah, so, uh, you know, we were all kind of working on different things that were happening. A couple initiatives had been mentioned. Um, I think, you know, Councilman West is kind of the band director here. He got us all together uh, and in the room together to kind of talk through some of the different concepts. With this being the neighborhood approach, the biggest thing was we needed to let the neighborhoods know that it was an opportunity. And so that was why it was pretty important um, to have as many partners as possible kind of reaching out to folks. And um, so Amanda, along with Heather at Bike DFW and Miguel at the coalition, everybody was kind of reaching out and uh, letting people know that, hey, there's this opportunity out there. Um, if you're interested, you know, let us know. And then we, um, some folks we talked with very quickly or quite a bit to kind of work them through the process. And then uh, there were a few permits that I did not know about that were a surprise that came through as well. So it was fun to see how it kind of expanded and uh, the different conversations people were having about this concept and why it was useful or the questions that they kind of had around it. Um, getting it on the ground, I mean, it really is. Once the permit's approved, it's just talking to the barricade company. Uh, they've had about, you know, a 12 hour turnaround. They'll get out on the street. We give the neighbors all the supplies and then it's up to the neighbors to make it all happen and, and bring the street to life. 
Well, thank you again for feeling all of those questions and really doing a great job reaching out, being on the news. I'm sure that helped get a few more applications in um, and that the news has been really supportive and, and it's it's always cute to see little kids riding bikes in the street. So um, that's an easy one. Um, Ms. Diana Torres Rivera, I'm really interested in hearing about what your experience has been as a user of this program and what the application process was like for you, what kind of feedback you're hearing from your neighbors. Again, yeah, I don't know that we are gonna ever be uh, used to this virtual world, <laughs> but I'm thankful. It's um, always something. <laughs> for sure, I am starved for human contact, um, being stuck at home since March with three young children, um, ages six, four, and one. So, um, that I think that when my husband saw it online, he saw it on I think it was on the Better Blocks um, Instagram, and uh, we, as a family, had already started sort of an initiative to showcase Sunset Hill where we live. Um, a lot of places like Winnetka Heights, which is just like a few streets away from our street, have a bigger presence online, and with COVID, not just retaking the streets, but you're stuck at home with your um, devices. So you mostly have to find ways to connect with people that, like um, I think it was Councilman uh, West and Miguel Solis were saying, you know, cars are not the end all be all. So when I, when, we, when I first saw it, my husband said, do you want to do it? And I said, yes. And as an extrovert, it was a great excuse to talk to my neighbors because I had not met any of my neighbors. And um, we've only been in the street for a year. And this time when we chose this house, we've been in Texas for five years. Uh, I was born and raised in Puerto Rico, but I lived for six years in Seville, Spain. And I did not drive one day in those six years. So I 100% saw Oak Cliff as this place where I could uh, replicate some of that and have have some of like an outdoor life with my neighbors and have a community. And then um, when we first, you know, we, we didn't set down roots anywhere until I started working at Bishop Dunn and I fell in love with Oak Cliff. So this is my, I'm going into my fifth year working there. So Oak Cliff really, uh, spoke to me that way, of course, the diversity here. And when we found this house, we were very intentional in that it had a front porch because we also wanted to have that openness towards towards the community and not just be closed in. And then, you know, inhabiting the front porch with a one-year-old is really hard when she doesn't know not to run into the street. So uh, slow streets was this thing that just fell on our laps and I ran and I think we texted a few times, you and I and Krista, and I was like rushing and I met my neighbors and it's like really hot afternoon. Everyone I spoke to um, was super excited about it. And then as soon as I had that, like, I think it was 25% plus one, I submitted it, but I still talked to everyone else um, afterwards. Um, and it was mostly like this rush to get it, uh, but it didn't it didn't mean that the rest didn't approve. It was just that they came afterwards to come and talk to me. No one disapproved actually, and a lot of people were like, "This is what we need," especially those who live near the corner of Twelve and Montreal, South Montreal. Um, there's been accidents that, that corner house. Um, it's the east corner. Um, they had to put up like a, a very sturdy steel fence in, in their house. And because there was once uh, an accident, a lady actually died in her car because she came and then she was rushing on 12 and ended up uh, on their front yard um, and, and their neighbor's front yard. So, and they also have young children. So it is something that apparently like everyone was super welcoming for. Um, and then it also encouraged us to meet each other. I found out that there's mostly like three families living here and they all know each other. And a lot of the people here have been living here for more than 25 years. Uh, 
in my sense and and being like a spanish speaker and a spanish speaking home it is great to see that a lot of these families are also hispanic and that they're um, generational uh i think you know citizens of dallas that it gives my children like a, a way of identifying with with other students and other neighbors so that was one thing and then the other thing is that a lot of people rush from, um, I would say, southbound to get to 12. And that is something that we noticed right as we moved in. So my husband got a little slow sign already, like maybe a few weeks in that we started living here and we had put it up there when the children were playing, but it was mostly to keep the children aware that there's gonna be cars coming. Um, and they, they rush because there's no stop sign at the Wentworth and uh, Montreal uh, intersection. And then a lot of my neighbors mentioned that, that, that going south, a lot of people just rush. And it is not people that live here at all. Um, you, I see it also on Nextdoor, on the Nextdoor app and on the Facebook page. Um, it's not just my street, I would say, but our street is close enough to Hampton that people sort of uh, rush through it. And then at dismissal from Sunset, where literally I can see Sunset High School from my house, and um, it is never a bother. The students are great. I love seeing the students go in and out walking. It is something I saw in Spain. Um, my brothers in Puerto Rico and sisters in Puerto Rico also walked to their own school. And that those things are things that I think enrich the community because people see other people rather than just seeing cars. And that sort of separates you your your personality from just like someone passing by you see a car you don't see a person so i love that and i love that my my kids just say hi and wave to everybody and i like that we can do that so the only problem is that the kids park in the north uh, block uh from me uh so that would be between 10th and wentworth and then sometimes there's people that can't get out of their driveways and then at dismissal, uh, one of the neighbors, the closest we got to 12, they, their question was like, and after the 30 days, what are we going to do? This is amazing. So everybody's like super enjoying it. And I'm like, I don't know, maybe we can have data to prove to the city that we should maybe make this one way at dismissal or and at, uh, like 10 is also one way during those peak hours. Um, and a lot of them are already, uh, and like as Mr. Um, Ali was saying, like the, the city does work efficiently. And this is another thing that was proven to me uh, because it was less than three days that I heard about this and everything was done. Everybody was extremely surprised. And I think that there's this cadence and inertia that people expect from the city that it's gonna take too long and it actually did it. So they were super surprised that the response was uh, so quick in setting all this up. So what what next? Well, and I told them maybe we we have to have a meeting and we talk about it and we see because the the people living on that east side closer to 12 at dismissal close to like four because Dallas I do dismisses at 4:15. Um, they they sometimes can't leave their own their own houses because everybody's waiting to get to 12. Um, where they sh when they should maybe leave through Jefferson or leave through 10th, which are already one way. So that's, those are things that I wasn't really aware of because I live right, right in the middle of the street. So I don't really have that issue. I can choose to see what side is less, you know, uh, congested to, to leave. And I'm also a teacher, so I'm not here until five-ish. Um, so yeah, those are, those have been things that have uh, arisen, especially from, from people who've been here longer than I have. So I've been able to listen a lot and to learn a lot. I met uh, Benny Guzman who just moved into the street and it, he turns out to be in uh, Councilman's West T. That's been super exciting and I wanna help the community. I am mission driven. Uh, my Latinos Unidos at Bishop Dunn, that club, we're going to have to find different ways to do service, especially with COVID. So if there's anything we can do more virtually or uh, towards social justice or helping the city, you know, I, I just wanted an outlet for connection. And I think this, this has been great to just connect with each other 
physically um, safely as well. Wow, thank you so much for that, Diana. It really sounds like this was born out of a real safety need, but it's provided such a social benefit to you and all of your neighbors during this difficult time, but also as new residents. Um, thanks for explaining the dynamics with the school too. That definitely impacts things. And that was a perfect lead in to my next question for Councilman West. Um, these installations were planned for 30 days and a few are already halfway through. What would you like to see happen from here going forward? And are there other COVID related programs for streets and public realm that the city is implementing now? So I'd love to see it expanded. Obviously, I'm a big fan of this and um, <clears throat> the, the challenges we're going to have are <clears throat> ongoing funding. How do we get this funded? Because I don't think the coalition wants to continue funding this forever. Uh, I'm not going to. I'll let Miguel speak to that, though. Uh, but I, I think that eventually we're going to have to find a sustainable way of funding it. I have brought up with staff. We have increased the amount of fees that um, developers have to pay when they close down um, a street or sidewalk for construction to bring Dallas up uh, to be pretty much balanced with Houston and Austin and the other big cities. We were way low for years, um, so we brought those fees up a little bit. Um, I have suggested to staff we maybe try to capture some of that increase in fees to help sustain this in the long term. Um, the challenge will be kind of if we can come up with some type of funding source within the city to, to maybe do as a match to the neighborhood or something. Um, what happens if every street wants to do it? I mean, how do you I, I think we've got to figure out long term um, that that's obviously not sustainable, although a lot of us would love that. It sounds like everybody on this call probably would if we were just walking everywhere. But um, you've got to have you got to have some of these in addition to the main arteries, you've got to be able to get in and out of the neighborhood, you know, for, for regular traffic too. Um, and so finding that balance between um, just having a few streets and having every street closed, like what's the magic number? And so that's what I hope everyone on this call will stay engaged with that, including the neighbors and, um, and of course, staff, and then finding a way to fund it. So that's, that's what we're going to look towards. I think, you know, COVID doesn't seem to be going anywhere in the next a few months, so I don't see any reason why we can't expand what we have now and continue that on through you know, through possibly the rest of the year. Um, other other initiatives that are going on right now, you know, I mentioned earlier the parklets, which is essentially where um, you can close down a public parking space uh, in front of a restaurant or retail store and expand your seating out in that area, or even in some cases your product display out in that area. And um, you can already, you've always been able to do that in private parking lots, but um, with the permission of the landlord and building owner, but this allows it to be done in the public realm itself. So that's ongoing. Uh, we're one of the earliest cities, uh, thanks to Better Block, Amanda, and others uh, in the country to actually lead that. I think we were mentioned in a national article in New York City. We even mentioned us that, that Dallas had, um, no one thinks of Dallas as forward thinking in this kind of stuff, but thanks to Better Block and some other folks, we're, we're trying to get there. Uh, there is a uh, there's a, a a bike lane initiative on Commerce Street in downtown Dallas that's that's coming uh, coming up. There is a, uh, a uh, some discussions, but nothing's happened yet with expanding some of the pedestrian thoroughfares in downtown. I'm hoping to get get those talks uh, going as well. Um, so there, you know, this is an opportunity, as Miguel mentioned earlier, for during COVID for us to try some new things. Um, because people are living differently, they're they're home a lot, doing things virtually, uh, and so the traffic patterns have changed. And um, this is our chance if we're going to do something that's a little bit outside the box. Let's let's try it, Mr. Hatefi. Back to this specific project. Um, where are the implementation locations exactly, and what concerns have you heard, and how's the city dealing with any um, with different scenarios? Uh, sure. Um... Before I answer this question, I have to say that, you know, um, this is a neighborhood driven uh, program, basically, right? We received the application based on uh, the needs of the uh, neighborhood. And uh, what we try to do is to make sure if, uh, you know, a couple of neighbors in uh, several blocks very close to each other, they're all asking for uh, this type of permit to avoid that scenario because 
and we're going to have a domino effect on the uh, traffic pattern uh, that requires a traffic study. So uh, we try to uh, give one block at the time to each neighborhood as um, spread as possible. And again, that's based on the uh, request that we receive from the applicant. Uh, the locations are um, varied, of course. We have a um, neighborhood in East Dallas. We have neighborhood in South Dallas. We have neighborhood in uh, Oak Leaf, in up, Uptown area. Um, and keep in mind, we only allow 10 um, permits for this uh, kind of pilot program to see um, what are the challenges that we're going to face in future if you want to expand this uh, program. Uh, so far, we haven't had any, um, I guess, we haven't heard any concern or any uh, negative feedback from neighborhood. Um, some people uh, seem to uh, love this program pretty much, that they want to add more blocks uh, in their neighborhood to the program. Uh, but as Council Member uh, mentioned that, you know, the, I guess the funding uh, is a challenge also uh, with that program. But yeah, uh, we haven't heard any negative uh, feedback so far. Wow, and Councilman West, you were saying too that you haven't heard many complaints from residents this go around, um, and and we definitely heard about some of the bigger, uh, more global issues that residents are seeing on their streets in terms of safety. Um, could this maybe be a first step towards some kind of a muse street or something that might be more long term implementable to? for traffic calming on neighborhood streets? I, I love the concepts uh, of it. I'd love to see a, um, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't know if that was for me or Ollie, but. It, it, well, kind of, I had a different question for you, but I think we've answered it. <laughs> cool, no, I, 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 love the, I love the concept. I would love to see um, some examples of what that would look like. Uh, um, you know, if you're taught is a muse generally, you know, you, you guys are a little more skilled in this area than me is or muse is generally like what we have here on the slow streets or is there another element to it? Yeah, I think similar with uh, similar. More permanency and things for cars to drive around to just make it a little more safer for pedestrians. Got Seems it. Yeah. Similar to what we've set up. Yeah, I, I love the, the discussion. I, I think that we've got to, uh, we got to start modernizing our uh, our thoughts i mean you, you look at some of the you know the old uh, street and design manual was was from like the 60s and uh, we just got that uh change to include complete streets now um you know here in the city and that that happened early in 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 my term i know public works worked really hard on that um getting that done and uh and there's still some of the old mentality amongst my fellow council members and, and amongst some staff, Ali, I'm not talking about Ali here, he's, he's forward thinking, uh, but there's a, there's a mentality in the city on cars are always gonna be first. And, and if you live in the downtown area, that's just not always the case. You know, if you're in some of these closer neighborhoods that, that are walkable and have these little retail centers, you, it's, it's okay to think outside the box, I think. We may be bringing just the right people to the table to talk about some longer term initiatives that would really change the way our city looks and acts. Um, Mr. Solis, I'm wondering, since um, you're good at coalescing ads around for your vision, um, how has this initiative played out? Has it played out the way you were hoping to see an impact in the city? And what's your takeaway from what we've experienced? Yeah, I mean, I think in the immediate short term, it has played out the way that we were hoping. And, and we measure performance by um, one, uh, it actually becoming a project. It's not, you know, we, 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 we got a lot of ideas at the coalition. And so it's really exciting to see something like this, you know, actually, actually take hold and be so warmly embraced by both you know, our partners, a great visionary elected official like Chad, and then great city staff like Ali, who, who you know took it and immediately ran with it. Um, but in, from a long-term standpoint, the jury is way, way out on this. Um, because for us, long-term success is revolutionizing the way that our city goes about planning. Um, and so there are four major things that I'm, I'm thinking about as we look towards the next steps. Um, and, and Actually, most of this was sort of summarized by Diana's experience and then some of what Councilmember West just mentioned. Um, 
The first two are, are basic city planning tenants that I'm not sure that we have embraced in the city to this point, but I think with a program like this, we ultimately could. The first is this idea of um, the theory of induced demand uh, and what can happen if you plan a city to focus less on commuters and more on pedestrians um, and, and even and even like you know density and walkability. So if we build roads, we are going to see if we close roads, what you heard from Diana is that people find alternative roads to use. So, you know, I think one form of success would be this program leading to more roads that are either reformed in the way that you've already spoken about, Amanda, or completely um, gotten rid of. I don't think that's a bad thing. I don't think that's a radical concept. Um, and I think that we're proving that if you close these streets, um, everything will be okay, at least from a pilot standpoint. I think the second thing would be this idea of social interaction being a prominent, uh, playing a prominent role in city planning. So whenever stuff started to close down with COVID, I remember this meme going around that like nature is, re is, is, uh, is being reborn. You'd see like deer out on the streets that you didn't see again. But if you like, if you listen to what Diana said, we're kind of seeing the same thing happen with human beings in their own neighborhoods. They are actually going out and meeting neighbors. They are having discussions with people. Um, and this goes to, the, you know, back to something that Jane Jay groups wrote about, you know, years ago, the idea of having eyes on the street uh, and that being some, uh, a new form of public safety. It's just being out, seeing people, and you're actually able to interact uh, in a more frequent and consistent way. So those two general concepts of induced demand and, and social interaction, I think, would be things that we would gauge success on from a long-term standpoint, uh, were we to see city actions match the moment. The third thing is the city as, is at an inflection point in its own planning processes. And this is where I want to give the city a ton of credit. You already heard from Chad this idea of complete streets, redefining yeah. re the way that we think about how we plan our streets. But there's also something the city's doing, um, the strategic mobility plan. So they're right in the middle of this planning process that has the potential to really significantly reform the way that we plan specifically our core, but also the way that we look at land use as it relates to traffic, as it relates to housing. So while the slow streets program is not necessarily going to completely change what's what's happening in the city it has the ability to be a proof point that helps inform the planning of the strategic mobility plan um so so that would be another thing is is allowing a pilot like this to show what that what dallas can do and how big it can think in the strategic mobility plan and then the last thing is that we have to have people like chad west for far too long, we've had sort of an, an, an anach uh, anachronistic paradigm that our, our council members have walked into government um, using. Uh, you go back to the way we've are always done things. You've got to have people like Chad and others who come to the table saying, not only are we going to think differently, but I'm going to work hand in hand with city staff to plan differently, and we're not going to waste a moment. I mean, this guy has only been in office for a year, and already he's already talked about multiple projects that he's been in, you know, in charge of as a council member that have changed the paradigm. So that's long term success for us is seeing more council members being creative this way, uh, strategic mobility, and that it's actually putting an emphasis on people versus cars, and then playing with these ideas of, um, strategy around induced demand and social interaction. So that's what I want to see. That was a great summary of this conversation, Miguel. I really appreciate your perspective on this. Um, right now, we'd like to turn it over to questions for you guys. I noticed one in there, Amanda, that I thought was that was a really good one on the why only 25 percent. I think that came in a while ago. And I want to say thank you to Miguel for the very kind words, though. That was that was nice. Thank you, sir. Um, so we had talked about that and I think staff, uh, someone on staff had been recommending like 75% or a much higher number. And I can't remember what Better Block was recommending. Uh, it, we, 
I think we zero percent. <laughs> uh, and we were uh, we found this as a as a compromise. It was on it, yes, it was a little bit on the low end, and I was a little nervous about it as an elected official to be to be to be honest, um, because yeah, it leaves potentially seventy five percent of neighbors that. Um, could have been upset, but I was very happy to hear that um, Diana apparently talked to all her neighbors, which are great, or quite a few of them. And I understand that um, our other two that are kind of close to my neighborhood, uh, they talked to a ton of their neighbors. So people went above and beyond the 25%, even though that was set as the base threshold. And we set it, I'm trying to think back to our conversation, but what I seem to recall is that we wanted to set it low just to just for this pilot and then to see how the first 10 went and if we needed to adjust it upwards we would um, but we were going to lean heavily you know correct me if i'm wrong krista on the block captain that if there were upset neighbors we were going to lean on that block captain to go talk to them yeah that's correct so actually the other programs that i'm aware of around the country they had zero um, that was that was kind of what I was basing that off of was what others had done, um, and it was to remove barriers of entry. Um, and again, knowing that like not a lot of people want someone knocking on their door right now, um, and you know just uh, people are out, people are gone, different things like that. And um, so I do think twenty five percent is a good number. Um, you know this program isn't perfect. I think we have some things to tweak. Uh, the biggest thing being you know if you're in an apartment building and you have to have twenty five percent of your resident your neighbor sign off that's pretty prohibitive um what we've also seen everyone you had to reach out to everyone so you had to notify everyone you only needed signatures for 25 percent um and that's why a lot of neighbors are coming back and having more than the 25 percent sign off um i did hear from one community that wanted to do this program they had more signatures than they needed and um, they had talked to everyone but they had a couple neighbors who were very much against it and um, ultimately decided not to do the program because of that even though they had the sign off that they needed um but another big part of this is it uh, it is as easy to install as it is to uninstall um, and that was a big part of it is it's a demonstration we're testing it out it's not always going to work out and not every bit of it's going to work out um, but that's okay because we're going to kind of test it out and then we can adapt and shift and change as needed so that 25 percent i completely understand you know getting that sign off and having that uh and i'm glad we have it but i think if you go too high then um then you can't even test out a concept from that it looks like two other questions we have um kind of talk about the permanence of the experience and whether it would be possible to come up with a a way of um having a, a slow street for a designated designated number of days or hours to allow communities to have this experience um, maybe without a, a full commitment to it um, and then diana was asking too is there a way that we could make this permanent some way of making parking spaces and maybe adding landscaping in the street that sounds a little bit like the muse idea that we were discussing but maybe also adding to that a grid of one-way streets through the neighborhood so that's that's a really interesting idea, Diana, especially in Oak Cliff where we don't have garages. Is there a good formal or technical definition of a low traffic street? Sure, I'll, I'll take that. Uh, well, for the sake of the pilot program that we have here, uh, of course, you know, uh, the low traffic goes back to the traffic study of all the streets and come up with the uh, numbers to see what is low traffic or not. But for this uh, pilot program itself, we uh, decided to stay with all the local and residential streets as as long as you know the streets are not heavily um, i guess populated by a lot of multi families that you know generates more traffic of course on the street and it's more of a single family houses um, along the street along the typical neighborhood then uh, we could consider that as a low traffic uh, neighborhood but again yeah the the i guess the Definite answer to that one would come from the traffic study that to show what is the low traffic, what is not. But again, local and residential streets we consider that as a low traffic. Great, thank you, Ali. Hey, Amanda, I have to sign off. We're heading to the airport. Thank you again. Thank for you doing so this. much. Thank you to everybody for uh, coming today and for being passionate about slowing down our streets. You guys have a great, uh, great week. We appreciate your work on this, Chad. Take care. Thank you.
Are there folks from other cities on the call that are considering implementing something similar to this? We had a unique situation in Dallas that it happened to be easy for us to figure out a path forward. If we hadn't had the black block party permit, um, it would have been a lot more difficult, I think, to figure out how to create this program. We're really lucky with that. Well, while we have um, more questions appearing, uh, I'll just ask the panelists, what uh, other thoughts do you have about the program or are, are there any um, lessons learned that you'd like to add to the conversation still? Yeah, I think one thing I mentioned earlier is we've got some tweaks. I think, um, you know, if the program is to be continued, one thing I want to look at is how do we make it easier for people who live in apartment buildings to do something like this? I live in an apartment building downtown. I can't uh, do anything with my streets around me, though. I'd love to get my hands on Elm. Uh, but, you know, what are some ways that we can make this program a little bit easier um, in, in those situations? Uh, we're working on uh, one permit that will be around a senior center. And so I think that'll be interesting to kind of look at um, that and, you know, the COVID impact there as well and allowing people to get out on the street. Um, and then also looking at the other uses in one of our signage, we wrote, um, you know, the streets closed to through traffic, but it's open for running and bicycling and um, using it, you know, in those ways. And I thought one of the comments on that was really interesting. It was someone who was excited to see that we had used the word running and um, because she was saying, you know, when it's left out of the conversation, we fail to make a place for it. And then there's a turf war between bike lanes and sidewalks. Um, so I thought that was also, you know, an interesting point to this and considering all the uses of slow street and who can benefit from it. Yeah, along those lines, I think it's interesting to think about transportation lanes as mobility lanes that users of all kinds of wheeled mobility vehicles can use, including those in wheelchairs. Um, I remember being in Barcelona and seeing a woman walking her dog from her wheelchair in the bike lane, and it, it just opened up a whole new way of thinking about transportation. Um, you know, because of this bike lane, she was able to go to the grocery store and be more independent than she may maybe could have been living in the suburbs without any kind of access like that. So mobility lanes and and the yeah turf war between the runners i see that all the time yeah I see a question here from brian about if we're tracking metrics um so all of our block captains have a survey that they're working on and they can share it with their neighbors to also give their feedback and um, so i'm hoping that in that way we can capture the good and the bad and um, because again we really haven't heard complaints yet. The program is still new and in some streets they just got it set up this weekend. Um, so, you know, maybe that's coming. Um, so we're tracking all of that and then um, trying to work with them on um, people counts and traffic speeds and traffic counts as well and trying to see how we can get that set up because a lot of people have asked, how do we make this more permanent? Um, so we need some data to be able to back up their experience uh, beyond the anecdotal, which is also great, but we also need some of those numbers to back it up as well. So long answer short, yes, we're working on that. All right, I'll say one last thing and then I'm done. Um, Ollie really has been fantastic to work with and the public works team. I'm still amazed that he takes my call every single time because um, I call a lot, um, but they've been great to work with. And uh, a question for him later will be, I see a lot of barricades around that aren't in use. So I'm just wondering, can I just borrow those for 30 days or so? Uh, I keep taking pictures of all the ones I see and thinking maybe I could uh, use these a little bit later. Absolutely. I like the, first of all, thank you, Krista, for the nice word, but uh, I like the boring, very <laughs> terminology. Uh, I think uh, we have to ask a legal, uh, you know, department <laughs> on that one. But um, actually, a lot of um, um, these barricades are left on the street sometimes without, uh, you know, the contractor to come back and pick them up. Sometimes we have to actually, as a city, to go and pick them up and uh, store them or uh, call them to you know come back and uh, get it from us uh, but yeah i wish there was a mechanism <laughs> that we can actually give it out uh, to y'all but yeah unfortunately not at this point <laughs> if you leave it behind the city gets to take control of it <laughs> <laughs> well if there aren't any other questions coming through 
um, I think we can wrap up. I wanted to give a special thank you to our panelists and for putting this program together and for sharing the information and talking about it. Hopefully we'll be able to see more programs like this across DFW. So thank you, Councilman West, Miguel Solis, Ali Hatefi, Diana Torres Rivera, and Krista Nightingale. And I'll turn things back over to you, Carolyn. Okay, <clears throat> excuse me. Thank you, Amanda, uh, for moderating today. And thank you also to all of our panelists for joining us. I know your time is valuable. I appreciate you spending some of it uh, to, with us today. A quick plug for the Center for Development Excellence here, here at the COG. We can be reached uh, through our email address, which is E and D, uh, which is our initials, environment and development at nctcog.org or through our website, www.nctcog.org slash ENVIR. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate your time.